Hey everyone and welcome back to another industry report. Today it's pretty major because we get to take a look at Microsoft's overall strategy for the next gen and of course a little bit of drama. There's one funny thing in that it really does seem like Obsidian are just trying to be Bethesda now. I mean, uh, come on, they're, they're basically doing something that almost looks like an Elder Scrolls-esque game, so there's that going on. And then there's the Halo situation because, uh, man, that Xbox Series X footage looks a hell of a lot like an X-Bone or an Xbox. It looks really weird, so there's that to jump into as well, as well as the whole thing of, uh, well, if a console is really just about getting people into your walled garden, uh, and you can actually do that with a subscription instead, then why the hell even bother with the console? Because Microsoft's plan seems very interesting when compared to Sony's. Now, if you want to do one thing to support our mission of bringing you content and also get cool stuff in your mailbox, then there is the Patreon. We've got the Tiernanog art, so uh, I don't know, for those of you who maybe know a bit of your Irish lore, then you can sort of, well, you can read into what that is, but yes, fun little explainer in the back as well. We've got, um, there is a sticker that comes along with these boys as well, and hey, do you play a war Warlock in uh, in D&D, in World of Warcraft, and Destiny 2. Well, uh, hey, we got the Warlock class pin as well. So all that's on the Patreon. And uh, you know what? That's really the thing that backs up our team. It's, uh, it's massively helpful. So patrons, thank you. That is the loot for this month. And with that said, let's talk about Microsoft. Well, the highlight, of course, was the reveal of Halo Infinite's campaign, though even its struggle, I mean, the stream itself, it chopped a little bit for us, which was odd, but basically it looks like a typical Halo affair. Now, the thing for me is, I love Halo, and this kind of reminds me of a bit of Halo 3 and a bit of Halo 1, right? It's got the equipment system, it's got that big Halo Combat Evolved scale feel that I'm pretty excited about. That said, open world design, I could be worried about that, we'll have to see, but certainly the gunplay looks pretty good, the actual gameplay looks great, to be honest, but the issue is uh, why does it look like a current gen game? What the hell's going on? I mean, compare that to the engine video for the Slipstream engine that we got like two years ago. And man, it's really, really bad. And I'm not normally the sort of person to mention this. I am normally just saying, look, if I can get 60 FPS, I don't care what it looks like. I just want it to play smoothly. But I've got to admit that when I am thinking about a real big sort of major title to push a big new console, I'm definitely disappointed with what those visuals are. I don't think it's up to snuff. And for me, some of that is even in the art direction. It's small things like how rocks are blended into the terrain. It's, I mean, there's things like pop-in that seem unacceptably bad as compared to the standard being set by the PS5 and even by other Xbox Series X games. So I do not know what is going on there, but certainly it's a bad look for Microsoft. Even though I think anybody who's thinking about this analytically can see that the Series X is actually seems to be a more powerful bit of hardware than the PS5, but clearly, however it's being used in their big showcase game, it's just not delivering the goods right now, and I think that's a really rough look for them to have to deal with. But still, I will definitely say I appreciated having a slice of gameplay there, and it having things like local co-op and just all that stuff I think is really exciting. It's just, man, why does it look so old? A bit bizarre. Otherwise, though, really having a lack of gameplay was a real problem. CGI trailers did kind of dominate yet again, but I think it was really for a lot of IPs that people were more excited about or maybe promised stuff that was a bit sort of bigger in scope, and that's maybe why people were a bit more okay as compared to some other events that have happened. In terms of standouts, I would say that the medium is uh, is the one that looks particularly interesting to me. However, there's a really scummy bit here, and it's kind of funny because this is something me and, <laughs> me and my co-founder did in Adobe director, if you remember that bit of software, for our first year games project, that idea of having like sort of a twin worlds uh, thing going on when you hit a button. Of course, what we did was obviously awful, um, but it was just sort of funny saying, oh wow, here's somebody that's actually competent doing a bit of that idea. It looks really cool, but there's a big issue here. And that is that the the fackers have patented it. They have patented the idea of playing two characters at once in two different universes. I hope that that is something that's effectively unenforceable because like, patenting something like that? That's, that's so scummy. Screw that. I, th that's actually annoying to the point where, even though this is one of the games that was the most appealing to me, I'd almost want to sort of protest it out of, uh, out of principle, because I really don't like fundamental things like that. I mean, look, patenting new technology or innovation, sure, but 
I don't know. This doesn't seem like that. This seems more like a game style thing. So I'm really a little bit worried about that. Then there's also Everwild. Uh, now that's one that looks really gorgeous from Rare. I will admit I do have a little bit of a bias. I have a good friend who works at Rare from university. So, you know, I probably have a bias towards being excited about, you know, some of the cool things that he's probably working on. I don't know what project he's on, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, looks gorgeous. Though it seems like nobody knows what that game is going to be other than there's a lot of nature and they want you to feel immersed in it. So that'll be interesting. There's then Avowed. Now, this one was interesting to me because of Obsidian. Because Fallout 3 happens. And honestly, Fallout 3 is... is oh, it, it's Bethesda writing, you know? I mean, you take the, the funniest real-life events, you put on some Oblivion music, and suddenly they seem like a Bethesda game. That's what Bethesda writing tends to be like. So, Fallout 3, it had the vibe and the style, but it really wasn't that great, as compared, at least, to Fallout New Vegas, which, yes, was an absolute buggy mess, but when it came to the storytelling, the writing, man, it was so clear that Obsidian were the real pros there. Then, Fallout 4 was pretty disappointing to many in its narrative, uh, and then, of course, you had, um, oh, not the Outer Wilds, the, the Outer Worlds, yes, come out from obsidian which very much i mean to be honest i i did see it and think oh okay right <laughs> here's some uh, critique of capitalism now it's in your face it, it just seemed i don't know the setting the different corporations and stuff didn't grab me too much to be honest but a lot of people really loved that game and it was clear that it was like in that same vein of fallout new vegas and now we have avowed which almost looks like it's obsidian with their microsoft game studios money just being like yeah we're just going to make a big first person rpg you know like those uh, people we used to work with, Bethesda, do. So I think it's really quite funny that they're working on that. I mean, you know what? I think they've got better chops than Bethesda when it comes to a whole bunch of stuff, so I will be very, very keen to see what that game actually ends up looking like. But in terms of other things, I mean, there was the sort of just hype reveals for um, Stalker 2, very excited, and Fable, which could be pretty cool, but really there's not that much worth mentioning there because they were just quick little sort of CGI glimpses. Uh, now, there is one weird thing with Tetris Effect Connect. I thought it was a pretty cool trailer, actually, but, um, I mean, a bit weird in that you can't really let the word exclusive fool you when it comes to connected right because it's actually going to be out on other platforms in summer 2021 although there's still no news on the coming soon steam version so a little bit weird and then there is something that's a bit scummy for the ps uh the ps4 players and that is that because it's coming to xcloud it's not going to be in ps4's um, remote play because of contractual reasons which really does kind of suck and honestly that sort of right cat fighting look we all understand how stuff like that works but it's okay to say that it sucks for us as the end users. Now, also, another topic I want to talk about here is the use of the word exclusive, because it's really being put through the ringer, and it's getting a bit silly, in my opinion. And really, Microsoft's, their, their different marketing messages are beginning to clash here. They've repeatedly been stating that they're not going to force anyone to upgrade, and you've got things like, you know, cross-gen releases and smart delivery, meaning that Xbox players can play the same games for at least, you know, the next couple of years, no matter what. But then you've got games like Forza Motorsports, and and, uh, State of Decay 3 that were listed as Series X and PC only. Uh, no mention of uh, Xbox One or Smart Delivery, so that's either Microsoft changing their promise a bit, or it's really saying that those games are just going to be coming out so late that that's not really going to be a factor. Or hey, maybe somebody just messed up title cards in the presentation, so there's that. Now, when we move on to third party then, we've got um, some highlights from towards the end of the show. There were seven games highlighted as being built to launch exclusively in Xbox consoles. Uh, so far, only one of these, the gunk, has been uh, confirmed as an all-out exclusive, though. Uh, some others then will hit consoles and other consoles next year, and most already have a release window on the PC platform, too. And really what Microsoft showed yesterday was effectively just, uh, it was just them doing like a bunch of time releases with, you know, some fancy lights and fancy show, and that exclusive guy speaking into the microphone as he does in sort of presentations like this. But really, though, what stood out the most to me was Games Pass, right? Because that's the, that's really one of the focuses they had throughout the entire show, and it was just brought up so many times that really, it brings us on to the next sort of section of this video, and that is Microsoft's strategy in the next gen, because it's so bloody different to the PS4. Now, it could, or the PS5, it could be different to the PS5 because maybe Microsoft know that just in the immediate immediate, say, four years, they cannot compete with uh, PlayStation Worldwide Studios because they're just maybe, maybe they're just a little bit behind in that. Certainly, they did struggle with the exclusives in the previous generation. So, 
I have to wonder if that's a part of why they're moving to this model, but certainly their model's very interesting. Uh, you know, they've been so ever-present lately and dropping just so many bits of info just about everywhere that it's it's kind of becoming hard to get a clear view of what their plan is because there's just so many working parts. But they definitely are mar- sort of married to this whole cross-gen, very consumer-focused, value-focused notion of things, as compared to Sony, who are very traditional, right? It really seems like with Sony that it's a generational reset, um, but for Microsoft, they are obviously not trying to show that. They're trying to show the opposite and in a way that will feel like you've just got more value being consumer on their platform because, well, they're going to honor your past purchases through smart delivery and all of those things. So it's that situation where, you know, the generational reset of the PS5 is less consumer friendly, but it's very clear in that these new next-gen games are new only next-gen games. And in a world where Halo Infinity, and I say this as a Halo fan, but when Halo Infinity looks like an Xbox One X game, yeah, maybe this idea of it's PS5 only and it looks absolutely gorgeous, maybe that's just going to be something that's going to win hearts and minds for Sony. Kind of tricky to say. It sort of sucks in consumer-friendly ways, but it does show this clear sort of message of advancement, right? Like, hey, do you want next-gen? You've got to go with Sony. And I suppose there is also a bit of a thing there where if Microsoft uh, sort of Worldwide Studios titles have all got to be able to scale down to an Xbox One or an Xbox One X, you could maybe argue that that would change some fundamentals and how those games are made. Now, whether that's true or not, I think that with uh, just with the sort of clash in marketing, that's maybe something that will permeate the minds of potential consumers. So we'll have to see how that actually plays out. I mean, certainly what it says to me is that uh, honestly, PS5 plus PC is the way to go. I think it will be that way for uh, for many people, actually. Maybe just need a situation where my PC can sort of be comfortable in a couch format for playing games like that. But uh, yeah, it certainly is something. And I think it really does show that Microsoft have got extreme, extreme confidence in their subscription model. I certainly will say that's them competing in a way that Sony currently just cannot. And now there is also one other angle here that was brought up by uh, Daniel Amat, and that's the idea of lapsed gamers, right? People who maybe no longer have got the time or money to get fully invested into games in general or in just to a triple A, I'd say that Games Pass removes so many barriers and is available in so many places that, yeah, so many games for like $15 a month may be a really good way to just get in those general audiences who are maybe not the people like, uh, you know, you watching this video or me making this video. So we should think about that. There's then also Lockhart. Now, Lockhart has been essentially this rumor of a lower powered console coming out from Microsoft in the future that's really a strong value angle, like, you know, a $200, $250, something like that. I think more like $200. So something that just means anyone who's interested in gaming can get an Xbox console and get access to all of these good Xbox things. But Microsoft have not confirmed that. They've not denied that. It's just been a rumor floating around the place. Now, that said, the idea of hardware confusion between, you know, Series X and Xbox One X, that must exist because, uh, well, the Xbox One S All Digital Edition and the Xbox One X have uh, actually been discontinued. Manufacturing has ceased for them. And that kind of would suggest that they're moving on to something like Lockhart in the future so that they have different options. But again, that's just not been confirmed or denied. And it does further make people think, well, hmm, if all of these games have got to run on Lockhart, will that mean that different architectural decisions will be sort of made in their creation to make them scale down to that hardware? It's really hard to know. That's just total rumors and scuttlebutt. But again, I don't think Microsoft are doing themselves all that many favors, at least in the eyes of core gamers, by just leaving that up to speculation. So it's a bit of a weird thing. But anyway, I will say that this whole, you know, all generation thing, it just means anyone can do, anyone can do Xbox. And That idea of subscriptions and accessibility is massive here because what I want you to do is I want you to think about what the core of the console games sort of market has always been. And it's never been making money by selling the consoles. It's been selling a walled garden, right? So that if somebody buys games on your console, even if it's a physical game, there's going to be, you know, some sort of like your platform fee. And then, of course, in the digital age, you're purchasing a game on the Xbox store, the like the PS4 store, the PlayStation store, whatever. That's really been the goal of these consoles. They don't really make money by selling the hardware, at least until many years have passed and the prices have all came down. Now, when you look at Microsoft's model, it's like, yeah, they're still playing that game. But also, if you can just get someone in on a $15 a month subscription, why bother with the console? I mean, obviously, there's lots of reasons to bother with a console, but it does show that they can actually diversify that business to the point where it's less reliant on console sales. I mean, how many, you know, countless millions of PC gamers are there? And the answer is many. 
and they're probably not people who are going to get an Xbox Series S anyway. They're probably people who might consider getting a PS5 because of the Sony exclusives. Well, now Microsoft have set themselves up so that they can actually increase their general market, right? Their, their consumers, God, by millions, millions and millions and millions through this subscription. I think it's already been really successful. If they can double down on it, then they're just going to be competing in ways where Sony can't really do anything to stop them because Sony just don't have an in there. So I think that is going to be extremely interesting because like, hey, even if Sony did a PS++ or whatever that was a Game Pass-like thing, they're not going to be able to get it on um, PC. Probably. Just think about the fundamentals, or at least it would take them like five, ten years to actually make that happen. Very different from Microsoft. So I think that's a way where Microsoft might actually just be guaranteed a few wins for free, just winning by default because of what they can do, because of who they are. They're sort of just their infrastructure, their balance sheet. There's just there's just stuff Microsoft can pull off, and that's just going to be a fundamental winner for them. I mean, even in their recent earnings call, it really did seem like they were doing really well. And I imagine that's only going to accelerate once we get into this period of the new consoles coming out. So certainly with all of that going on, and if they're then able to, you know, bundle xCloud into Game Pass Ultimate and just make Game Pass Ultimate this kind of a la carte, like Microsoft experience, if they can do all that, get that backwards compatibility in in a way that's better than Sony, I honestly think that Microsoft, even if they don't have those exclusives, I think they could be having small to medium, maybe even a few large wins in so many different other parts of the sort of general gaming market that no matter what, they're going to win. And I actually have a sneaking suspicion that this might be one of the more equitable console sort of wars. I actually wonder if both, like if, if Sony will win and Microsoft will win, and that really the key learning for all of us will be good luck trying to be a third company trying to come in there because these two have got it shored up. And maybe that gaming's actually became so big that there really is room for both of them. And that certainly is something that Phil Spencer has been saying for quite some time indeed. So I really wouldn't be surprised. So basically, there you go. It's a massive business model. It's all a little bit muddied. And there was an unfortunately high amount of CGI trailers, which kind of sucked. And Halo Infinite. Look, I, it's weird, right? I am excited about it. Extremely excited about it. Why? Because I love Halo multiplayer. I actually love Halo single player too. I love Halo gameplay. I love the world. I love like just, oh, just the setting, the vibe. It's all great. It's got the Halo music. It kind of still looks like Halo. But man, I it's so weird being somebody who normally is just like, I don't care about graphics. I just want a fun video game. And then seeing this and being like, well, okay, it's running at a good resolution, 60 FPS, but man, that looks iffy. And I think a lot of people have seen that as well. I mean, for, oh, I've forgotten his name, Big Angry Brute Man, who sounds like Garrosh from World of Warcraft, and I wonder if he's in the same voice actor. But, like, it's weird. It's like they didn't use a CGI model. You know, like, usually in games, you have a CG model for a character. Even if it's a sort of in-game CG, they'll often swap to a higher, a higher poly count version of their model to be able to pull off some of those closer shots. But they didn't even do that. It actually just looked like it was just regular gameplay model of him. And, man, it looks so rough. And then there's the meme, you know, of the happy brute, because it seems like the brute's facial animations aren't there. And <sighs> this game is coming out in a few months. And yeah, Aaron Greenberg, you know, he later talked about that. He said that, you know, the game gets so much better with every, I don't know, it was weekly or monthly builds that they get from 343, but the game was just continually looking better and better. I'm like, Aaron, yeah, man, I know. And Aaron said, you know, it's one thing looking at a stream, you got to look at it at 4K60. And I'm just thinking like, the resolution was never the issue. Some of that pop-in was a bit wild. Some of that texture work just looks really untexturful. Things look like plastic. I get that you can do PBR and you've got all this great lighting. I think they said ray tracing would actually be a future thing, a free update. But I get you can do all these things, but it's just not coming together to make a great picture. I mean, some of those landscape shots kind of felt like Skyrim to me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on there. I... I generally like to think that I can intuit what's going on when I see things, because at least, like, you know, I've worked in some game engines, and more importantly, I've... I've got friends who are way more intelligent than me that work in, in those areas. Um, so I usually like to think I can intuit what's going on here. And, you know, I can maybe, like, talk to some of our team, right? Like, talk to some of the people who, uh, you know, have done, like, you know, done a lot more work, like, actually in 3D and Maya and, you know, Substance Painter and stuff like that. And, uh, no, I actually just don't know why it looks like that. I don't know why it looks that bad, because it's so close to launch. 
And I get six months or however long it's going to be. That can make a lot of difference. And certainly there'll be things like, say, that rock texture. I mean, you can tweak that shader and it's not the sort of thing where, you know, you need to do it for every rock in the game. You just fix the materials and bam, there you go. They're better and it'll just work everywhere. But still... I'm really confused about that, so if you have some sort of insight in what's going on there, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, AAA is a whole other beast, and I know there are a few AAA devs who watch this channel, so I don't know if any of you feel like making some comments. I'd love to know what your read is on this. Uh, now, you know, it's like for 343, I mean, they, they have made a lot of real fun, sort of gritty, chunky, textured feeling Halo in the past. I mean, Halo 4 and 5, I think just, man, they nailed it with their sound design, things like that. The guns felt so good. So there's so many things 343 can do really well. And I'm just looking at this thinking, what? Hello? What? What's going on? I'd love to know what you think. There's my Halo, uh, I don't know, rant or whatever at the end. Uh, yeah, I mean, hey, look, Halo's coming to PC, though. That's fun. We're, we're playing Halo 3 now, so I, I do love this whole new world of Halo was on a PC. I mean, man, I'd tell, you know, 13, 14 year old me that he would have been very surprised. But still, a bit weird, and I'd love to know what you think. Thank you for watching this video. Do let me know where do you think Microsoft are going? What do you think their strategy is going to be like? And importantly, do you think they can compete with Sony even if they don't have some of those big Sony tier exclusives? I'd love to know. So that's it for me. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.